Thank you. Good morning, everyone, and welcome to uh, the 14th meeting of the Education Skills Committee in 2019. Um, we have received apologies for, from Oliver Mundell this morning. Can I remind everyone to turn their mobile phones and other devices to silent for the duration of the meeting? Our first item of business is the third evidence session on the committee's subject choices inquiry. Um, before I begin taking evidence, can I take an opportunity to thank all the teachers and parents who took part in our discussion groups on Monday evening in Dunfermline, and also to my committee members who were able to come along and take part in that event. These contributions were very valuable and we appreciate the time taken to attend the event. Can I welcome to the meeting this morning Eileen Pryor, Executive Director of Connect, Joanne Murphy, Chair of the National Parents Forum for Scotland, Linda O'Neill, Education Lead to the Centre for Excellence for Looked After Children in Scotland, Celsius, and Magda Wentworth, Off the Girl Varant, Coman Nam Parant. I hope I got that reasonably right. <laughs> so the Parents Officer and Parents Organisation of CNP. So a very warm welcome to you this morning. We're going to go straight to questions this morning. I'd like to invite Tavish Scott to open. Thank you very much, convener, and Alistair Allen will sort out the pronunciation in due course, but uh, um, I'm, uh, I'm glad I'm not the convener on mornings like this coming from Shetland. Um, I just wanted to ask um, at the outset about um, your involvement as organisations um, representing parents um, in the construction of the uh, BG section and senior phase of Scottish education, uh, because it struck it has struck the committee that one of the aspects in terms of subject choice that we've um, probably uh, struggled to fully understand is the origins of how we are where we now are. There's a debate that all my colleagues will get onto about how well it's working and lots of evidence around that that obviously the committee's been taking. But um, were your organisations involved uh, in any way in the construction of the, uh, of the way in which uh, education in our secondary schools now operates in terms of the split between from S1 to S3 and then S3 to S6? Any simple answer? No. No, it was... That, the, the Curriculum for Excellence format was basically presented um, as the vision quite some years ago now, but, mm. but uh, mm -hmm. no, not and, pre and presented by whom? By Scottish Government and Education Scotland. And did, were there any forms in that early stage where you were, you were asked to reflect on that, to give some thought to it, to, to consider how, what the unintended consequences might be? No. 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 Yes. Um, the National Parent Forum of Scotland was in the... Um, early days a member of the Curriculum for Excellence Management Board. It wasn't myself uh, who attended that, it was one of the previous chairs. And while we weren't, um, as Eileen has said, we weren't um, really consulted about how we weren't in, in the design of it, we were um, party to some of the discussions around how it would work. But at that, as we have always done in the National Parent Forum, we've always said that this won't work unless people share the information with parents and that has been the, 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 the most major failing across the whole of the curriculum for excellence the experience for parents is they don't know what's happening so they don't understand how it works they don't know if it's good and they don't know if it's bad they just don't know about it really at all so uh, when you say sharing experience and sharing information what kind of information did you ask for at that time to well we to always ask for information to at the level for parents. Parents yeah. are interested, interested in their children, naturally, that are attending school. Sure. So they need to know that the system has changed from when they were at school, because otherwise they just think it's the same. Why wouldn't you? Yes. And yes. so um, parents want to, want to hear, and still want to hear, the information that's relevant to them for their, chi for their child at the stage that your child's at. Uh, if you're in primary three, you want to know about what happens in primary three. And if you're in S4, you want to know what happens in S4. I appreciate you made the point it was one of your predecessors who had that responsibility those years back, but are there, are there any reflections you have on that now? I mean, in other words, do you think information is now being shared uh, adequately and successfully? Um, not adequately or successfully enough, I don't think. Mm -hmm. I think some pockets of, of schools uh, share information, but it's not widespread enough. And it's, I think schools, schools are busy places. They've of got course. lots of things yeah. to do. And I think, unfortunately... When schools, in the rollout of the, the, for example, the new qualifications, the schools really 
really, really consulted the parents of the children at that time and have kind of, it's dwindled quite considerably since then, but every, generally every parent that comes in all the subsequent years, they don't really know either, and they missed the big, the big meal shot, if you know, if mm -hmm. you know what I mean, at the, at the time. Mm -hmm. And so schools need to concentrate, um, in my opinion, on every year, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. it's, a big, it's a big ask for schools to do, but until the general population has a better idea of, of curriculum for excellence and all the ins and outs that are different from our previous systems, or even the system when, when I was at school, mm. um, then, then it's very difficult for a parent to understand what the differences are, what the benefits are. So do you believe that, for example, Professor Jim Scott last week in evidence to the committee said that the, each school should publish its approach to the curriculum? It's as simple as that. Do you th is that something you would hold to be a, a, of benefit to parents? I, I'm sure it would be of benefit to, to some parents within the school, but again, it's, for, for some of the parents, it would be over their heads. It's, it's, it's basic information has been lost sometimes, mm. and so it's difficult to just come in at the, the, the highest level. Sometimes there's, there's a need for more basic information across the board that you pick up as you go along for you know, your, your, young, your child's whole journey in school. Could, could I just say that, that the other aspect of that is, and Joanne is absolutely right, that, you know, it's a fresh cohort of parents and of children course. every year, yeah, so there's true. a refresh hmm. needing doing. Um, but, of course, one of the, the challenges is that, that by the very nature of schools, actually, schools will manage the message. Um, and so what they present to parents as being the best choice and the best option for our school, then actually very rarely will parents challenge that because they trust their school. Mm. So, you know, the, the information that comes from school and the decisions that are made by senior management um, about how we will design curriculum in this school will rarely be challenged. Um, and most parents will, will take that as being the best choice for our school. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, 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 the need to constantly re-message and also actually have conversations about the options rather than this is our vision of what's best for our school. Um, so there's a nuance there that I think um, is missing in many schools. Um, just to, to well, add... <laughs> Sorry, just to um, echo what Eileen and, and Joanna have said about the, the importance of communication with parents. That's certainly something at, at Celsius that we would say is extremely important. Mm. When we think about looked after children, we know that they live in a variety of different settings with a variety of different carers. So they could be living with foster carers, residential child care workers, with kinship carers. Um, and if they're being looked after at home, we know that very often their parents have had quite poor or difficult school experiences themselves. So that will impact on their ability um, or willingness or feelings around being able to engage with school. Um, and I think it's really important to think about how we communicate information and how we involve parents. What we know from our work with parents in North Ayrshire and, and Renfrewshire around parental engagement programmes is that parents, particularly in the transition from primary to secondary school, are telling us that they don't understand curricular structures, they don't understand the content, and they actually feel quite anxious about engaging with schools. Um, so what we know is that, that schools need the skills and the time to be able to work with, alongside parents, to build relationships, and to think about how we have those meaningful conversations uh, that become two-way, you know, rather than an imparting of information, how we actually bring parents into schools and help them to, to work alongside us to construct what's best for, for children. So thank you for that. Um, just so therefore, um, now that we do have the, um, the the two phases to secondary school, how do you reflect on how that's working in terms of subject choice? What's your what's your perspective on on how the system's now working for parents and uh, more importantly for pupils? I, I think unfortunately, not across the board, but um, I suppose part of the issue is that that there's a huge variety. And so in some cases, and we hear from parents, actually nothing's changed. We still have an old, the old approach of 2-2-2. Um, and so, you know, youngsters start making selections at the end of second year. They start working on their nationals in third year. Um, so a kind of no change mentality because that has worked for us in the past. So very much that kind of traditional 
perspective. Um, and so I think that, that sadly what we end up with is, is a series of one, te one session dashes to national fives, um, to hires, um, and advanced hires or whatever. And, and that's not really what the, the, the promise had been. Um, and in fact, we are still pushing many youngsters through national five who could be going straight to higher. So the flexibility of curriculum for excellence in terms of different pathways and moving straight through to hires rather than um, the assessments associated with N4 and N5 has not really been embraced across the board. Some schools certainly are doing it, but, but many are not. Actually, picture across patchy. Scotland in terms of how it connects it. Yeah. Yeah. Jo Joanna, do you have a um, it? It's true that it is patchy, but I see more and more um, schools moving to, from the 222 two, two to the yeah. 3 plus 3. Mm -hmm. More schools are not narrowing their choices as, as quickly as they were. More schools are offering a personalisation. It's, for, for, you know, it's, it's true, but a, a much more broad personalisation. So they're going maybe down, they're doing an S1, they're doing all the subjects, and then they're, they're picking two or three out of a, a curricular area, for example, doing geography and history and in, 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 in social uh, sciences, and then doing, again, slightly, slightly um, narrowing it again in S3 before going into S4 and doing their, their actual subjects. There seems to be much more option as well for doing voluntary or you know, extracurricular kind of things during the, the school day and through the timetable as well in, in different models I've seen. I think it's, it's fair to say that it's not across the board, but there is optimism that it is moving across the board and there are more schools who obviously are looking at their you know, neighbouring schools and seeing how they are doing it. Because it's a big ask for a school mm. to move. It's, schools sure. are, 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 you know, unwieldy places. And um, and I think that sit, as for a head teacher sitting thinking, how am I going to move this this beast in another direction must be very, mm -hmm. you know, exasperating for them. And looking at how other people are doing it must make it an easier job for them. Is it possible to define that? I mean, um, again, lo last week we, we saw tables of the 358 state schools and <coughs> state secondaries in Scotland and, and what's actually happening in subject choice. You've just given a very fair reflection on how, how you perceive that to be. Do you, do you have any numbers that back up the... The, the general direction of travel that you very fairly illustrated this morning. I don't have any uh, better numbers than, than you would have, no. Um, well, we do I, have quite a lot of numbers now, that's yeah. the thing. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but um, as I say, going across the board for maybe uh, five or six years ago, there would be there was a handful of schools. Yes. You're moving into to, to much larger, and I, I'm much larger, maybe a, a third, and moving towards a half of schools. In my sure. experience, talking sure. to different people going around the... That, and are start, start, certainly starting to make the journey because you can't do it all at once. Yeah, okay, good. Yes, please, Ms. Um I, I know the committee are aware from previous sessions that there are concerns about the dramatic decline in the number of pupils who are continuing with Gaelic, both Gaelic learners and Gaelic fluent speakers, as well as other languages. And I, I think there are a number of factors that are affecting that, but certainly in many schools, the subject choice, the limitation of six subjects um, at National Five is one, one of the factors that's having a, an impact on Gaelic, um, especially in, in smaller rural schools. It, you, they have six choice of six subjects, the columns that makes column choices very difficult. Um, and very often if these pupils feel that there's just no option to continue with their Gaelic studies. And for children who have come through Gaelic medium education, where all their, all their teaching is through Gaelic, then they're going on to secondary where they have very limited access to Gaelic. Um, it seems a huge loss that these children are leaving school with no qualifications and very often losing their Gaelic language skills. There is, there is an answer because other schools, the bigger schools, it's easier to, to uh, manage this, called Gaelic Glasico. All, this, all the children do Gaelic as a compulsory subject along with English and maths up until National 5. And James Gillespie's in Edinburgh is moving towards that, you know, building on their curriculum through Gaelic. Um, and I, I do feel for children who have had all their teaching through the medium of Gaelic for all their primary education, that they should be given the opportunity to at least leave uh, school 
with a, one qualification in Gaelic. Or in a language, yeah, in, or in too, a too language. broadly. Yeah, yeah. The, the concern yeah. is... A and how would you language. make that happen? Uh, well, I would increase the, the option, you know, yeah. the subject choices to at least seven and national five. Yeah. I think that would give more flexibility more in, terms in the of languages curriculum, and so in terms of languages. Um, I would, and there's a question about what advice children are, are being given, pupils are being given regarding languages at, um, at that once they're making these choices. Um, and there are probably other factors affecting, you know, um, uptake of languages in, in secondary school. I, th I certainly think it's concerning and something that we need to look at. Um, there is there has been a focus on STEM subjects lately. Um, is is that at the expense of of languages? Hmm. Okay. Mr. Neil, did you want to come back in? No, no, that one. Okay, um, thank you. J just um, um, before we move to to the next committee member, um, one of the aspects of curriculum for excellence. And, um, and some of the discussion we had with parents the other evening was around the use of um, school clusters where, where people could go and study in other um, uh, higher qualification not available at their own school, but perhaps in a neighbouring school. And also the use of colleges um, to deliver some of the subjects and um, foundation apprenticeships as well. Uh, and also college lectures in some cases come into schools. And I just wondered if you had um, what your experience and what parents were telling you about that model. Yeah, Ms Murphy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, parents are, 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 are happy for their child to do the, the subject. Unfortunately, real life sometimes gets in the way. And that's, uh, for example, in a, a school, um, in a big city, the schools can be quite near to each other but sometimes the, the distances involved are, 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 are not really manageable. Um, also, there's a cost implication to get to the school for both in you know, financial terms, but also in, in actual time. You've got to get there and you've got to get back again. So there is, you, know, what's, you have to weigh up the, the pros and the cons. I can't see why in this day and age, when um, we've got the, the, the digital means that we have, I don't see why you can't sit in your classroom in your school and li link into a classroom in another school. I don't see why that's not an option. I know the e-school um, is, is rolled out across the Highlands, for example, but I don't see why that's not an option for class. And with teachers perhaps being, you know, and certainly moving um, uh, young people together if it's possible. But there's also, um, I know in some places, there's a kind of territorial issue. You know, you don't want to go to a neighbouring school. You don't want to put young people out of their comfort zone because they're learning and they can't learn if they're frightened or they don't know anyone. My own daughter wouldn't go to another school, which is about 300 yards from our house to study an advanced hire because she said, well, we all wear skirts at school and they don't, and I'm not going because I'm the only one wearing a skirt. And that was as, ba it was as basic as that. And, and that's, young people have to feel comfortable. So we ha that's why we have to, you know, have to think about ways they can sit in their own, in their own comfort zone and, and learn. Just a matter of interest, what advanced hire was it? It was a design and manufacture. Thank you. Um, but it wasn't about the not doing it. It was about the, them all wearing yeah. her wearing a skirt and them all not wearing a skirt. But that's that's her reality of her day, you know. Yeah, no, you know, it, it's interesting because part of what we're looking at in STEM is unconscious bias and what dissuades young women from doing it. And that might have been, you know, something that feeds into that process as well. And I think it, it's, you know, it's um, interesting. Just to, so thank you for sharing yes. that. And thank you to your daughter. She'll kill me. She'll absolutely kill me. And that's part of that is, is to do with me because I was the one making them wear their skirt, you know, so, but. Yeah. Um, Ms. Pryor, yeah, I've got a couple of members that do want to come in and we'll, we'll bring you both in, yeah. Uh, you know, I think that technology has its place. Um, and um, if we're able to use technology or if youngsters, particularly in the city authorities, if they're able to travel to college or another campus or whatever to, to study, then, then yes. And certainly parents, once they understand what the options are and, and the, the different pathways that are open to their youngsters, are generally happy to encourage them to do that. There are technological barriers. We know that in some schools, you know, I don't know what they're built of, but they don't allow, allow Wi-Fi, you know, that kind of thing. So we have to address the technology and, and enabling our schools to use technology before that can really be uh, a solution. It can't replace face-to-face, -face, but it can help that, I think. 
Yeah, Mr. Neil. Our work at Sales is, is mainly focused on working alongside schools, local authorities, further and higher education providers to try and improve educational experiences for, for looked after children rather than directly with um, looked after children themselves and their families. And our experience um, over the last few years is definitely that we have seen an increase um, in the, the flexibility of pathways and um, collaborations between schools, further and higher education institutions, workplaces um, to a big extent. Um, but I think for looked after children, it's really important, particularly at that upper end of the, the spectrum, to be thinking about the additional needs that they might require. Um, if they are going to be sharing a timetable somewhere else, we know that these young people who have faced really significant adversity in their life, which might have an impact on their developmental stage versus their, their chronological age, which means although they might be 15 or 16 and, for example, capable um, of independent travel socially and emotionally, they might struggle to share a timetable. Um, they might need to be to feel very safe in the, the school that they're in um, and not cope very well, maybe going to a college placement or another placement um, for, for half the time. So I think really thinking about the, the planning and the support that we put around children, if we are going to have this flexibility, um, is crucial to making sure that that's successful for them because the additional support requirements um, don't cease because a, a young person is at the, the upper end of their, their education. Can bring in Mr. Greer. Um, I acknowledge absolutely the, the benefits that Joanna mentioned around uh, young people getting the opportunity to study a subject they might not otherwise get, particularly if it's something that they need to get to the next stage of their, their education. But when we asked Education Scotland about this a couple of weeks ago, they gave a, an interesting response that I'd like your reaction to. Um, I highlighted to them the lost opportunities involved in travel. So young people who travel to another school might miss out on extracurricular activities at lunchtime or after school. They might miss out on other classroom teaching time, depending on how the timetable is structured. Education Scotland's response was to say that the motivation they receive from travelling to another school and from learning in another school more than makes up for the loss of those opportunities, the extracurriculars or potentially the class contact time at, at their school. I'd just be interested in your response to that. I would say that you know it's a cost-benefit analysis, isn't it? You know, you have to look at what is the benefit of that versus what's the cost. Um, and that's a conversation that school has to have with a young person and their parents or carers. Um, and they make a decision based on that. So, yes, there are wins, but there will be um, issues. And, and, you know, I know that in the authority I live in, for instance, um, the, the timetabling was changed so that actually we now have a very short lunch break, relatively speaking, which means that a lot of extracurricular activities that would normally have taken place at lunchtime have gone. Mm -hmm which means that they are now focusing on after school. But when you're in a rural area and people are traveling, they miss out because they have to get the bus back home. So do you know, all of these decisions are not simple. Um, there's no one answer to it. And it has to be based on what's the priority for the young person involved. Um, I, I would agree um, with, with what Eileen's saying. I think the, the importance of good relationships um, and, and schools having the ability and the skills to get to know their children and young people and families so that they can have the conversations about what's most appropriate for them, what's going to be of biggest benefit and what additional support is required to enable them to achieve an experience um, to, to the absolute best that they can. We know that inclusion for children um, that are are looked after can be really, really difficult and they often miss out on things like extracurricular activities, after school activities and the importance of that social and emotional um, enrichment is crucially important for how they experience education. Um, we know that very often the young people that, that we work with um, attain at, at lower levels, unfortunately, than, than all other pupils and that's why that relational based approach to have the the, the conversations about what's going to be of the, the most importance and the most benefit to, to young people is, is crucial um, to ensuring that they get the best out of their school experience. And, and it's all very well saying that the motivation of the child will get them through that, to that class and, and that there will be some of our young people who are highly motivated and need, know they need that subject and are desperate to do it and that will get them through. But education's for all young people and 
we, and the personalisation and choice needs to be there for kids that, that kind of want to do it and know they would quite like to do it, but maybe don't think about it and, and can't really think about doing it every day. And they've got to go maybe in a higher, they would have to go, you know, significant times to that school. So it would really upset their routine. They, 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 we, we want our young people to be happy and to be confident and to have friends and to have their lunch and have all these things. And sometimes making them move to another school, sometimes that just tips the balance and they just, they just pull back because they're at a, you know, a vulnerable time of their life and they generally want to just be one of the gang. And that's unfortunate, and there's lots of things wrong with that. I'm not saying there isn't, but that's the situation we're in. And I think sometimes it's up to the school to try and um, think of, the, you know, having more than one person going and uh, organising it so that there's more, you know, it's more beneficial to the young person. So there's more of them going and there's different ways of, you know, subjects all working in the same time so that they don't feel isolated going to something themselves. Thank you. Um, again. Oh, sorry. Sorry. Um, in, in rural areas, travelling to other schools isn't going to be an option. So technology, I think, is the only answer. It's, it's the only way to deliver any kind of equality uh, in provision for these children who are in very small classes and small schools with a very limited curriculum very, um, sometimes. Um, and I think we do need to develop the use of e-school, e e other hubs that can deliver um, through technology to a number of schools. Alan, you wanted to. It was related to that point. It was the point that Joanna Murphy was the same point Joanna Murphy was making really about the need for things like eSchool. It was without sounding too pedantic. It was just to make the point that you referred to it as being there for the Highlands and Islands. eSchool, just because it's based in Stornoway, it's not just there for the Highlands and Islands. In fact, there's people in other countries using it as well. So, in a way, I'm just making the point rather than a question that eSchool and things like eSchool can be used nationally, not just in the Highlands. I, I was only making the point that it's used well there, yeah. so um, that's you know I was I was giving you a compliment, <laughs> uh, but um, it's a shame that you know we've had the Open University has been going for 50 years and and in Australia you know they do all these things when people live yeah you know significantly further away from each other than they do in Scotland, and they seem to manage it all right there. <laughs> thank you. Um, I'm going to move to Miss Lamont. Um, thank you very much. I'm interested in the extent to which parents and young people should have an impact or influence over the curriculum. So I'm kind of interested in what proper engagement with parents and young people looks like, not at the individual subject choice level, which we might talk about in a minute, but actually in terms of what the school offers. I wonder if you have a view on, for example, um, should young people have a, a right to X number of subjects? And if so, what would that number be? And does it matter if different schools do different things? That's fine. I, I, I think part of this conversation, um, which is very focused on subject numbers and subject choices, actually um, we're kind of losing sight of the purpose of this. We're losing sight of the purpose is to give young people the opportunities they need to make the best of their futures. Um, and for some young people, that will look very different to what it looks like for other youngsters. So my sense is that this isn't about numbers, numbers of subjects or, or whatever. Actually, it's much more fundamental like, than that. And it's about um, school management and families and young people sharing a vision of what they need as a school community to support their children. And in some cases, you will have children who are young people, because they're not children anymore, but young people who are, have a clear vision, they want to go to university, they, want to, they need these hires, and actually what we design in this school should enable those youngsters to do that. But, but that should not inhibit those youngsters who perhaps need more support or are on a different pathway. So I think, you know, I just think that the, the, the kind of focus on numbers takes our eye off the ball, which is actually it's about the young people doing the best that they can. Um, and so to me, fundamentally, it's about that school community and the school management and that wider community understanding what they need in that community, what, what suits their circumstances to enable their youngsters to do what they want to do and what they're able to do. How do you think the system then manages a school in a more deprived area, 
where disproportionately young people who will not be sitting five hires, who as a consequence will have to, are more likely to have to travel than in a more prosperous area and more likely to be in multi-level classes in the school because how do you manage that, the child who wants to do the five hires against the fact that that school can't offer what perhaps a school down the road can offer? At what level is that, I mean, I hear what you're saying about numbers, but at what level is that decision made? Because if a school says, our community, the majority of young people in here are not going to do five hires, therefore we're not going to offer five hires, we're going to direct resources elsewhere, there will be young people in that school who can't achieve their ambitions. And I wonder whether, how do you manage that? Because it feels to me that there's just a, a dilemma there for a school or for a local authority, or as a general group, families, as opposed to individual families. I wouldn't deny it's a dilemma, but I think that it's not beyond us to come up with solutions for that. And, you know, we've talked about um, use of technology, accessing other programmes, and, of course, SQA exams are not the only route for young people. You know, and again, that's a kind of a bit of a fix that we have, that this is about nationals and hires and advanced hires. Actually, there are many other qualifications for young people. Um, and, and this was what I was alluding to earlier when I said that, that actually the message that parents get is, is managed by the school. So if the school and the school manager say, this is our best route forward to focus on X or Y or Z, um, that's what, for the most part, parents will, will buy. But, but one of the conversations surely is about the range of opportunities for young people. You know, one of the things that, that exercises me is that many parents get very wound up about the number of nationals a young person can take. And yet we know that, in fact, the number of nationals you accumulate is not going to have any impact whatsoever if you want to go to university. That's not the conversation. Actually, they, you know, we should be focusing on hires for those young people. So... Do you know, I, I, I just get a sense that we're very caught up in the rigidity which the system is caught up in of nationals, hires, advanced hires, when actually the conversation should be a much more flexible one about the range of opportunities that's available to all of our young people. And it, it needs to be remembered that, <coughs> excuse me, um, that the senior phase is a three-year programme. So more and more and more of our young people are staying on to, for those full three years. And it's about what they leave with. And it's not about what order they sit them in and what, and you know, if they, and again, the progression they do them in. But parents are, that's, this is a completely new system for a parent. There's going to be nothing like this for, for parents in Scotland. So uh, why would you be able to just imagine that? Again, parents don't know this. So they don't support something because they don't know about it. They, they say, and they always, I mean, it's human nature to just de default back to what you knew about and that worked then and that's all right. But, you know, it didn't work then. It wasn't working. So we decided to change it. And, um, and so now we need to put, again, we need to put a lot more support into helping parents understand the, the system, let alone it doesn't, you know, it doesn't matter when you sit your national fives or your hires. I don't know personally of any schools that don't allow children to sit five hires. There is always an option to sit if you want if the young person is able to sit five hires i believe that, that every secondary school allows that um but again we can't rule our system while those young people are, are important we can't run our whole system around the kids that are doing five hires all the and so we have to think about all the rest of them that are doing things and are having so the options are right for them as well I ask what you sorry um oh, wait. Could I, yes, sorry, could I just, you know, a growing number of parents are enrolling their children in Gaelic medium education in primary school, and their assumption is that that will be, the, their children will be able to go through Gaelic medium education to the end of secondary. Once parents and families get to secondary, they, re, they have realised that's not the case, and in fact, you can only sit one higher at the moment in Gaelic. Um, so the, there's there's been slow progress at secondary um, for Gaelic medium provision. We need more qualifications, um, but we, we also need to increase the opportunities that children have to, to continue their education in the medium that they started that education. And at the moment, we're, we're not doing the best for these children. They're, they're immersed in Gaelic up until 
um, secondary, and then they have very little provision. So the, their needs are not being met. There are, with parental engagement, um, there's a good example just now in Edinburgh of a group of parents who are working with Edinburgh City Council to develop Gaelic um, provision at secondary, and they're hoping from August this year to, de to deliver nine subjects through the medium of Gaelic, which is, is good progress. And so there are answers to this, but it's, although Gaelic is a national priority, um, very often I think local decision making at school level, local authority level, is not reflecting that status. Ms. Yeah. Um, I, I think there's certainly a role for, for pupil voice and, and parents' voice and go in some way to understanding how we might think collectively about how we make these decisions. Um, we know um, through our work in some local authorities that both the, the voices of children and parents um, and education as a whole is often missing from the, the child's planning process. Um, we also know that placing education prominently within a child's plan will go a long way to improving educational outcomes and experiences for children. And I think if we... Um, could think about how we work alongside schools to help them get better, more confident at gathering that data, gathering views of children and parents in a, in a meaningful way and making sense of that and then how they collectively use all of that data and insight and wisdom alongside the, the structures um, and systems that they've got in place that might go some way to being able to make some decisions based on the the needs of the whole population of a school or a cluster or a local authority, which is rooted in what children and parents are telling us is going to be most beneficial for them. Thank you. I was particularly interested in, in some of the, the issues around particularly looked after children. I wonder if you've, well, two areas that would be interested in. What are the consequences for a young person who may be moving from one school to another? if there's complete flexibility in the curriculum? Have you got any evidence of what is happening? If these decisions are made at school level, the capacity of a young person to fit in quite often when they're maybe moved to short notice and there's a crisis in the family or whatever, that they're not able to fit into another school curriculum. And I wonder how you think that can be addressed. And the second question I'd like to ask you about is the impact of the decision to get rid of certification for all, that is for young people I would have taught, who were perhaps looked after vulnerable, got foundation qualifications, they might have managed to squeeze general qualifications, were valued by the school because they had an external exam, they felt valued, um, and there was resource going into that. Do you think there has been a consequence to the decision to end that kind of bridge into perhaps the higher education or to be engaged in education for some of these young people? And were you consulted at all? And that's one of the things we can't establish is who decided it would be a good idea to make National Force, for example, not um, examinable externally. I think um, school disruption for, for looked after children um, is a, a very significant issue. And it's something that we see in the, um, the statistics, the educational outcome statistics for looked after children. What they tell us is across the, the indicators of attainment, attendance and exclusion, the more placements that a, a child has in a school year, um, the less well they do compared to, to their peers. Um, we know, as you've said, that young people often have to move placement at short notice um, and that that can have an impact on their, their educational journeys. Um, in an ideal world, um, these moves would be planned, schools would be um, consulted and young people would be consulted um, in, the, in a planned way um, to help them settle um, in new placements if they do have to move school. But we know that this isn't always possible for reasons around care and protection. We also know that another issue um, is around children who are looked after out with their own um, local authority. And what that can often mean is that, that those young people um, are having delayed access to education due to concerns around provision for additional support needs. Um, we don't have enough data at the moment on how many children that currently affects. Um, we know that some local authorities have significant high numbers of children that are looked after in another local authority um, and other local authorities have high numbers of children that they, as is termed, hosted. Um, and all of these um, 
all of these factors impact on how children are able to engage with education. We know too that children who have had to move placement um, and consequently move school are at much higher risk of exclusion on admission um, and that means that children are admitted to school but they go through a sort of tiered um, exclusion approach where they're maybe missing a subject because it's not offered on that curriculum um, or they're on a part-time timetable maybe because they've already covered a subject or it's felt that the, the school that they're, they've moved to haven't got the the appropriate additional support needs qualifications. Um, it's an extremely complex issue for the, for the young people that we work with, but we do see it um, reflected in the educational outcome indicators. We know that really robust planning using GERFEC principles um, for these young people and involving the whole team around the child and incorporating children and families' views does go some way um, to ensuring that moves are kept to a minimum and that any school move um, is as unimpactful um, as possible. Um, but I think it's certainly an area um, that we need to be attending to to ensure that we're ensuring equity of access for children that are in these really vulnerable situations. I'm thinking that disproportionately young people who have been looked after will leave school at the school leaving age? Around 72% of children um, leave school, who are looked after, leave school at their statutory so school. So if we have age. an exam system that's based on three years right up to sixth year, um, and say, well, it, you, may, you may not get to do it the fourth year, but you can do it in sixth year, we're actively then saying that there's a group of young people who will disproportionately leave at fourth year have not got that. Um, option, that's not something that they'll get. I wonder, should you, do you think there should be more work done around that? You know, some of the evidence we got last week suggested that an unintended consequence of some of Curriculum for Excellence was that the most vulnerable, disadvantaged young people are actually faring worse, specifically because, in my view, part because of that. I wondered whether, what sort of work should we be doing in looking at what the offer is in fourth year with amongst disadvantaged groups? Um, I think uh, absolutely. I think there's because um, our, our young people do tend to leave school earlier than all other young people, there's additional risk factors in terms of um, whether or not they do feel able to go on into to fifth and sixth year. And we do have some data from the CFE um, levels um, that illustrates that there's already a gap um, at P1, P4, P7 and S3, quite a significant gap across reading, writing, literacy and numeracy and talking for our looked after children, which I think goes some way to explaining how they're experiencing education, but also helps us to think about what supports we need to be putting in place before children even get to fourth year to ensure that we are planning right from a, a very early age when we are initially spotting these concerns young people are presumed to have additional support needs unless assessed as otherwise. Um, but we know that not all schools um, routinely assess looked after children for additional support needs. And when you consider the significant adversity and trauma that they've experienced, my view would be that it would be quite unusual for a young person not to require some level of additional support in school to ensure that they've got equity of access to the curriculum. So my view would be that planning has to take place from a very early age around um, education, right from primary school into what young people are going to do when they when they reach this, the senior phase. We know that looked after children have exactly the same aspirations as all other young people. Um, and what they tell us is that it's often us as professionals who set the bar lower. They tell us that they want us to want more for them. Um, and I think, you know, as we've We've acknowledged schools are very busy environment and um, working alongside looked after children and, and getting the best for them can be very complex and that's why we need to do the things that we know work to make the biggest impact so ensuring that we've got good planning structures in place that we are routinely assessing for additional support needs that we are involving parents and carers in the most meaningful ways possible and that we're un understanding what children need um, in order to support them right through that journey um, and not just on that upper phase um, of the, the curriculum. Thank you. Uh, Miss, okay. Thank you, Convener. I, I would like to carry on my colleague's line of questioning. Before I do that, can I just say I identify absolutely with 
everything Miss Wentworth is saying about um, Gaelic education. I'm having a major issue in my constituency just now, exactly along the lines you're talking about, which I'm working hard to resolve. So um, totally identify with what you're saying. Um, Ms O'Neill, um, can I just um, uh, clarify, um, as advocates for looked after children, do you deal with schools directly or do you deal with the local authorities? Sometimes we work directly with school to support them to improve um, educational outcomes. Other times we work um, with local authorities. Um, our, our work is mainly focused on building skills and capacities of those that are working in and around education with children and families, really to think about how children are experiencing education. Um, we want them to have the most positive experience possible in order to be able to attain. You talked about um, issues around, you know, flexibility and, and, and things like, uh, you know, not being able to take part in extracurricular things and all that sort of stuff. Do you feel that schools are doing enough to, to accommodate the needs of looked after children? Do, they, do, do you feel that they're listening to what, what you're saying on behalf of the children to, to support them properly? I think that the, um, the situation is certainly improving um, and I think particularly over the, the last few years people have become much more aware um, of the, the needs of looked after children, some of the, the issues that they can face. Um, the feedback that we get from our education forum members um, is that it's a, it's a very complex issue, that looked after children are very often a priority amongst priorities um, and that on a daily basis um, they are working to try and improve outcomes from a, for a range of vulnerable learners. We really recognise this. Um, schools are trying to do their best um, but it can be very difficult to understand what the most effective things are um, and what the most effective way of doing that. Part of our role is to try and support people um, that are in those jobs and we've developed a, what we call our our blueprint for education called Looked After and Learning, which lists the, the six areas that we know make a difference in improving educational experiences and outcomes for children. And it's a benchmarking and self-evaluation toolkit that schools or local authorities can use to really focus um, their resource on what makes the biggest difference. And whilst this is looking at improving outcomes for looked after children, the the real benefit of it is that there's nothing that um, services will do um, within that guide that won't be of benefit to all children. It's just coming at it through the lens um, of looked after children. So we would encourage schools to be using evidence-informed approaches um, alongside practical solutions um, to embed improvements within their schools. And you, you said that more data would help um, the situation and for you to compare. Is there much variation throughout schools, you know, geographically even? Um, you know, I'm thinking about rural schools, urban schools, and or schools in you know le less affluent areas. Is there much variation from from your you know knowledge? The, the educational outcomes statistics, um, which are a sort of snapshot of how children are doing um, in education, mainly focused on the the school leaver population does break the data down into local authority areas for some indicators. Um, so things like attendance, exclusion, post-school destinations, um, the return of Scottish candidate numbers, which helps us um, understand um, where, where children are. Um, and it does show us the regional variations. Um, and I think that's really important because what it does is shows us the area, areas that things are working really well in. And I think it's important to recognise that, that so many schools are doing really good innovative things for our young people um, and also that, that care um, isn't a, a determinant of doing more poorly in education. Um, we know for example that children that are in foster care actually have a higher average attendance than the general school population and fewer children in foster care leave school with no qualifications than the general population which I think is really something that, that we can celebrate and I think what the data does allow us to do is look at the areas where things are working to find out more about that and think about how we share those messages, how we understand what they're doing but also look at the areas that um, are struggling and um, that do need a bit more support and help us to think about what support would be most beneficial for them. Thank you. That's really helpful. Thanks. Okay. Mr. Greer. Thank you. Um, I'd like to return to Jang Amit's line of questioning. 
Uh, we've already covered in, in some ways the um, inequalities that exist in subject choice in rural communities where, where there is a geographical challenge. I was wondering if you have seen any particular trend in relation to the socioeconomic makeup of an area. Are schools in more deprived areas giving young people greater restrictions on the subjects that they can choose from in your experience? <laughs> <laughs> Ms. Pryor, <laughs> thank you. Information gathered, we couldn't say. However, um, intuitively, I suspect that that's, that can be the case, yes. Um, and that's for all sorts of reasons. And, and you've rehearsed many of the reasons at committee. So difficulty in recruiting staff to more rural or more, de more deprived areas. Um, you know, there's a whole series of... of possible causes in there, and it's, it's multi-layered. Um, you know, I, I, I suppose, you know, one of the things I would, I would say is that those schools which um, have a strong focus on the league tables and the, the tariff points and, and, you know, numbers of passes at higher and so on, um, they, are, they are the schools that will, will focus on those more traditional routes, if you like. Um, and actually, very often in, in, in more deprived communities, the school is more focused on, on the outcome, whether that outcome is hires or routes into university or whatever. So, you, you know, there are, there are different driving forces going on in different schools, I think. We've... Sorry, Kavina. Who else wants to go in on that yeah, one? No, that's fine. Um, <laughs> Quite a lot of the, the data that we've got around this has been compiled by um, independent academic work. Do you believe that there's a role for Education Scotland or the Curriculum for Excellence Management Board here in trying to get an overview of what the situation is? And if so, what is that role? What should they be doing in relation to subject choice at the moment? I would say absolutely. You know, that, that Education Scotland is the agency of government in, in this realm. So we would expect um, whether they do the work themselves or whether they commission uh, universities or whatever to conduct that research, yeah, you would expect um, Education Scotland to have a firm handle on this um, because it's it's about meeting the needs of young people and that's that's our focus as organisations. It's, it's about how can families and carers support the outcomes for young people and we have to have a clear picture um, across the country to see um, what the various impacts are on our young people. Um, I think any um, new or emerging data collection um, would be, in this area would be very positive to give us a more accurate idea um, of the, the national picture. And I think when we're thinking about the, the range of data that we've got, um, that anything new we would want to make sure already aligned or aligned to what we've already got, because it helps us make more sense um, of the story that the data already tells us. And I think if we're really clear about the, the purpose for collecting data um, and how we're intending to use it, um, that will help us set up any new data collection methods. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, can we move to Dr Allen? Thank you very much. Um, I was interested to hear what subject choice feels like from parental perspective uh, and uh, particularly um, appreciate what you've, you've just said about the fact that most all schools I'm sure offer uh, the option to do five hires but be keen to hear what Ms Wentworth and uh, Ms Murphy um, would say about um, how it, as I say how it's experienced as, as parents um, particularly given that we do seem to have a situation where more people are coming out of school with more hires and I suppose my question is, how early do people feel in their school career that they are, uh, if not choosing, at least anticipating what they will be doing in their fifth year for hires? What, what's the, the young person's perspective and the parent's perspective of that? Perspective of that? Ms Murphy? Yeah. Um, across the board, parents are not involved enough in subject choices. They're not involved enough in the overall curricular development of the school and they're not involved enough in their individual children's choices. Um, part of the SDS offer is to have a parent-child teacher um, meeting um, in, at the point that the children are making their, their, those choices. And that's very, very rarely, that very rarely happens. Um, 
that, and you could say that if young people don't have a problem, there's no need to have this big discussion. But actually, we, 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 don't, we don't get to the bottom of the, the parents not knowing the system until the parents are involved. And the young people are in school every day. They generally know what's going on. Um, and they get plenty of, you know, they, they're going through the system and that, that's great for them. But the parents are, again, at an age where the, your young people are probably at their least communicative to you, um, not really that bothered about telling you what's going on. Um, my own experience is you get a paper back and you sign it and you send it back. And that's, your, that's, that's the parents kind of real, it's really all the parent gets. Um, unless there's a problem with columns and then you can't, you can maybe write on the side of it that you, they do not want to do this and they, you know, or whatever. And in my experience, the, the school has, has, has negotiated things and, and things get moved about. But I know that that's not always the case. That's what I'm driving is, and I know quite rightly, we shouldn't be fixated with, with numbers. But if, if a school is doing six subjects in fourth year, is that essentially determining the hires that somebody is doing in fifth year? more or less, if they plan to do four or five hires? I think, I think in, 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 in theory it, it doesn't, because the theory is that you should be able to pick up other subjects and you should be able to crash hires and you should be able to do, you'll have enough breadth of a subject. But in practice, it, it probably does. In actual, you know, in, in real young people in real schools, it becomes more difficult to, to move out of classes. If, if there is a space in a class, you can sometimes move, and if there isn't, you, you have to find somebody else to swap with. And so um, these, th these, while I, I do see the, um, a free choice and much more flexibility in, in columns, or, or not columns at all almost, in some schools, um, it's that, that's, that's still quite, uh, probably early days in that you can just pick up things that you've dropped before in, in, in reality. Um, yeah, I think it's very frustrating for parents very often because they do want to advise their children what to do, but the, the children are under different pressures at school. Quite often in, in small rural schools there will be some uh, competition with classes as well. Um, thinking that, you know, if there's six subjects, if you drop a language, I don't, I'm not sure what the data is, but I think anecdotally teachers say that it's very difficult to... to pick up a language if you don't have the continuity through fourth year. So the, the children, pupils are less likely to go back to language learning um, if, they've, if they've not continued. Is that, is that more true then of Gaelic learners than it would be of Gaelic fluent speakers qualifications? Or? Um, I, I think it applies to both actually. Um, but. If, if pupils if pupils have an opportunity to, st to study other subjects through the medium of Gaelic, that would mitigate in a way that their, their lack of study Gaelic studying Gaelic as a subject because they would be maintaining some of these lang Gaelic language skills. But as we know, there are at the moment very few schools where there is an opportunity to study subjects beyond first and second year um, if if they have that through the medium of Gaelic. Um, On the Sorry, were you? Um, so, you know, I think that the, the, the conversation around choices, um, you know, end of S3 going into S4 or end of S2, actually, that's too late. We need to be having conversations with a young person and their family carers earlier than that about their direction of travel and what, where they might be going and what their interests are and where their strengths are. Um, and, you know... That's not just me saying it, that's also around policy um, and it's certainly the way that, that we understand that, that Skills Development Scotland are trying to work with schools to have those conversations much earlier so that there are no surprises. We don't get to the end of S2 and suddenly you know, there's, a, there's a major decision to be made. Um, and you know, the, the reality is, and you'll have seen it in, in our evidence paper, you know, parents who are invited to an evening to discuss choices after the choices are made, really, you know, in what world is that okay? It simply isn't. So we need to, we need to sort that out and we need to just have those conversations much earlier. I think, you know, the continuity of language is a really interesting one and I've been in front of committee talking about the, 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 the one plus two 
and, and the same conversation about, you know, in primary school I learn Spanish or I learn German or whatever, but I can't study that when I go to high school. You know, th we need to read across. Um, it's not just Gaelic, it's other languages as well. If, if a youngster uh, shows a talent for whatever language in primary school, then, you know, actually we should be ensuring that they continue that into, into high school and, if they wish, on to qualifications. Given uh, the understandable pressure there is on qualifications in fourth year and fifth year, and given that a language, to pick up that point there, and this applies to Gaelic but other languages as well, may have been dropped in third year or even in, in second year, do, do we have any actual data uh, as yet as to whether these languages are being picked up? Because presumably for many young people, the only opportunity to do that realistically is in, in sixth year. Do we, do we have any information about that? SQA. I'm aware of, but I think that the, the numbers from SQA that are sitting Gaelic higher would indicate that that's not happening for the majority of pupils. Um, for whatever reason, especially with Gaelic learners, we've, you know, the numbers, it's been a fairly catastrophic drop in numbers, and I believe that's the same for other languages. So I think there are a number of factors there, but I think it's certainly something that bears more investigation as to what's actually happening with language teaching at secondary level. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I'm going to move to Ms Smith. Uh, thank you, convener. Um, we've had it put to us uh, in various quarters that there's quite a lot of concern about multi-level teaching, that youngsters in the same class are studying uh, for different levels of SQE. Um, it's difficult to get a handle on exactly how, how widespread that is, but there's obviously we've had some evidence in from a, a couple of subject um, professional associations from subjects that are very concerned about this. Could I ask what your experience is, or are you aware of a lot of parental concern about youngsters being asked to, dis, you know, to study two different levels in the same class? only know that it happens. We've never had any concerns from parents about it. Um, and uh, actually quite the opposite. We've had parents who've said that, that their youngster enjoys that experience. It's quite stimulating to be in with different learners working at different levels. And it, it actually kind of draws young people through the, 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 the levels. Um, so, and I know that in some rural schools, it's actually the only way to work, Sure. you know? Mm. Um, so I don't know. I suspect that the concern is, is from the professionals um, and looking at the number of teachers employed in different departments and so on, rather than um, the actual experience of young people. But I think it's the experience of young people that we need to try and gather on this one. Yeah. I mean, one of the... Um, well, we, we had it uh, last week from uh, Dr Britton, who uh, felt that you know perhaps that's not ideal for the teaching uh, profession to be asked to uh, cope with multi-level teaching. It builds a lot of pressures into that class. But you rightly say it's about young people. Um, but they, uh, it was the geographers, I think, who said that they felt uh, a situation where you have uh, National 5 and higher and advanced higher all in the same uh, class was something that was just not acceptable. But can I just be absolutely clear, you've not had any concerns about that whatsoever from any... No. I, mean, I think it happens in rural schools and in quite a few subjects, but that, that's the only option. So I think from parents' viewpoint, if that's the only way that the child can, can study that subject, and they will have National 5 higher and advanced higher in the same class, I think it can be quite uh, challenging timetabling these children from different year groups. Um, but uh, from my understanding is that it's fairly common okay. and not problematic. There will be small numbers in the class, which will make it easier for teaching. And do, do you think that situation, uh, if it does exist, has come about because of pressures of teacher numbers? Or do you think there is, you know, Good. Uh, Ms. Pryor suggested that actually it's very beneficial to youngsters from a motivational angle to have different levels. Do you think there are educational reasons uh, behind that multi-level teaching, or do you think it's come about because of pressure of teacher numbers? I suspect that for for many schools, it's trying to make the best opportunity for young people. You know, they're trying to fulfil the the wishes of the youngsters by opening up those those options. Um, if they weren't if the if 
if they did not do that, then some of those youngsters would not be able to study that subject, you know, and so it's a really stark choice. So, um, we should think also more, uh, a bit more broadly about the two-year hire, so that some of those young people shouldn't, don't necessarily need to do the National Five. And again, that's a real jump of, you know, of faith, a big leap of faith for, for a parent or the young person, because it's always about, well, what happens if I don't pass it, you know, and then I don't have anything. And, and I suppose it's back to having the, the faith in the practitioner. Um, that they know what the young person is capable of, and that would solve some of the some of the issues within the, the classes. You make a very interesting uh, point. I'm um, very much in favour of um, being able to uh, undertake a hire over uh, a two-year period. Uh, in fact, not necessarily actually sitting the National Five en route to do that, but simply bypass that if that's educationally beneficial. Um, do you have any advice to those who will be looking at the? Uh, structures within the uh, curriculum for excellence as to whether, and I think uh, again it was Eileen Pryor who mentioned at the beginning about this horrible uh, one-term dash, two-term dash that we have. Do you think there would be benefit in restructuring so that it is more possible uh, for young people um, perhaps to bypass the National Five and move in straight in so that in S4 and S5 they're taking two years to get it higher because again it's been put to us that universities still value uh, the the ability of youngsters to get five hires uh, all in one sitting rather than to take them over uh, two sittings. Do, do you have any comment on that? Well, again, I think it's, it's, it's beneficial for our young people and perhaps um, the universities need to think about that, that issue. Is it, is it we, they could still be sitting five hires in one go over two years or they could be doing you know, a mix and perhaps we need, it needs more thought at, from lots of different people. I think if it's about the young person getting the hire or not getting the hire, then there's no argument that they should be able to do it over two years, and they should be able to to enjoy the the time to to focus on the subject and not feel as if they are just cramming the subject in like they have been since. I mean, they've been talking about the two year hire since I was at school, and 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 it's still not a reality. And that was a, one of the major um, focuses for curriculum for excellence that the two year hire. Yeah. I mean, I I think that's absolutely uh, correct. I think it's a very strong educational argument for doing it over the two years. Um, I just wonder if the, the 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 situation in schools that have gone down to uh, six subjects uh, within S four whether that is as easy to allow for that um, situation where somebody would take it over two years as it is perhaps in a situation where you had schools with eight subjects and there was greater flexibility for that? Um, well, I'm not a you know, timetable expert, but I know that the young people don't need to be doing all of their subjects over two years and higher. The, the whole idea was that you could be doing um, some National Fives and some hires, um, and there could be a mixture, and you could be doing different ones over again over the three year period so that um so that it was again what you came out of school with and what you actually had and again it's, i mean it seems slightly basic to go back to the fact that we want our young people to have knowledge we want them to know what they're talking about we don't want the situation when they have left you, you leave for example your your higher national uh, modern studies this afternoon and you think right I never need to think about the war again, or whatever it happens to be, um, and you just immediately forget everything that you've. That, 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 there's no point in that. And the whole move to, towards skills-based learning and actually being able to um, use your learning rather than just have a, a, a photographic memory of facts and dates and equations um, is was the whole point of this. And so, in in that context. Um, I, th I think it's very important that youngsters not only have a good base in knowledge across the general curriculum, as in, in science, social sciences and arts, as well as English and maths, and that they are able to understand why they are learning something as much as what they are learning. I think you're absolutely spot on there. How would you respond to uh, a comment that um, Professor Lindsay Patterson made, that he feels that the curriculum for excellence has gone a bit too much towards the uh, focus on the skills-based uh, side of this rather than entrenching some of that knowledge within the core curriculum. He, he has a view 
that the core curriculum, perhaps for some young people, has been diminished at the expense of other subjects. Would, would you accept that or no? Well, I respect his position, and I think there are probably cases where that's correct. But as an employer, I, you want your, your um, employees to be able to take their, their knowledge of, of practical tasks and, and do the job. It might not matter that they know all the capitals of the world, essentially. They, but you want them to be able to take, I would like you to, you know, do these things and in whichever order you like and, and come out with them at the end of the week. And there was a great deal, part of the, the focus and the movement from, into Curriculum for Excellence was that our young people were not skills-based enough and were moving into the workplace and weren't able to actually manage and actually do their jobs. Yeah. And so school is more than just learning facts. School is, is about... Um, knowledge, but it's also about the social aspects. It's about meeting your friends, you're li becoming lifelong partners with people, and and sometimes in the in this cram to doing hires, all of the rest of it's lost. We, there is no point in our young people having, as we hear, and having a mental health crisis in our young people because they just need to sit and learn things. And it, you might say it was it was ever thus. It might it was like that when when I was sitting my hires, but I didn't have all the same social media and different issues that were going on at the time that um, that our young people do now and we need to collectively look after them and schools are, they're in school for a, for a significant part of their their day and so part of that has to be looking after the young people and not forcing them to doing some of the things like we do that make them do a higher in and in, in, as you say two two terms thank you that's extremely helpful thank you okay miss gorgeous I'd just like to follow up uh, Liz Smith's line of questioning with regard to timetabling, um, John Murphy, because I think um, you hit on an issue there with regard to how do you actually design a timetable to meet the needs of all learners when you've got kids doing perhaps a two-year hire, you might have some national fives in that class, and you're having to timetable for an entire senior phase, which is very different than what happened uh, under standard grade in the previous structure. Um, are you aware, therefore, and this is maybe just a, a question in general to the panel, of schools giving uh, pupils free choice as opposed to that very regimented column structure, which can lead to kids missing out. Yeah, there are schools that do give the free choice, and, and of, in, inevitably you have to have a column somewhere because you can't just all turn up, but whenever you feel like it. Um, but uh, I know of schools that use the, the young people say, "What subjects do you want to do?" They all write it. They all write down, and then these, the schools goes away and sort it out. Um, other schools have 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 the columns in place, but a much much wider. Um, choice of call, you know, subjects within the columns, so and much more flexibility. You know, two or three different options, but, um, and lots of schools now have a, have columns where you can do any of the above kind of thing in two or three of the columns, so that there's a greater flexibility. So it's not just the two. It was always you could do two sciences, but you could never do, you know, two or three art subjects or two or three social sciences. And that's and if it seems to me that sometimes in Scottish education or any education, let's not just blame Scotland, um, that we take what our young people like doing, what they're good at, and then we make them do something else altogether. And the, the, the flexibility in the column choices needs, need, now seems to me to be to be um, to be welcome, and and and, I w and hopefully other schools will be able to go to their their, their neighbouring schools and, and and see what they are doing and and focus on that so that they can make the transition more easily. Thank you, Ms. Pry. I agree with that, and there are schools who are successfully doing that, and of course it's about prioritising, and for young people they have to think and prioritise what their top choices are and, and so on. But, the, the, you know, those schools start with that and work back, as opposed to the traditional um, thing, which was the, the, the poor soul in school who did the timetabling and sh shut themselves in a room for a week uh, to try and work this out um, according to resource, according to staffing, whatever. Actually, we flip that and we start with what our young people are saying they want to do. And they might not always get what they want because life's like that, you know, and that's part of resilience. But actually, we should be starting with where our skills are and where our strengths are and not, as Joanna says, actually kind of knowing that but still pushing them down another road. Thank you. Okay. Uh, did you want to come in, Ms? Just a, a comment about, you know, column choice that still there are too many schools who are using columns and where, where children are only having... Um, six subjects, we're back to this, it's too restrictive, I think, for them to, just to enable them to have a wide enough 
um, choice of subjects at that early level, where it, it cho you know, pupils will not be clear as to what they're going to do in the, at the higher level in their education or where their destinations are. And they need, I think, more flexibility for more pupils throughout Scotland, not just a few schools that are managing to do it. Uh, Mr. Gray? Um, I wanted to uh, follow up Liz Smith's line of questioning around um, the possibilities of um, studying for higher without sitting a National Five in that subject first. And um, the, we had some discussion there of the advantages that you can have there, two years to study for the higher and so on. Um, but there have been instances, Helensburgh, I think, is the one which springs to mind, where a school has used that model quite extensively, um, and parents, and the panel are, in a sense, representing parents, have proven extremely unhappy with that approach to their, their children's education. So I just, um, I mean, the panel were very positive about that as approach, but I think if I was the the head teacher of that school, I would say, well, it's all very well for you to sit and say that, but I tried to do that and had a parent's rebellion on my hands, so parents don't actually support that. Mr. Pryor? Um, because we, we, we did some work with that school at the time, um, and actually, do you know, it always comes back to relationships and communication. And so, you know, if if a school management makes a decision that that's the way that we're going, but does that in isolation without actually having the conversations with parents about what's the best route here and, you know, um, hearing parents, then that's what you end up with. And it was a very sad situation. Um, but it was primarily a relationship and a communications issue. Yes, I would echo that and also we should remember that it's not all our, it's not one or the other. We should be mi mixing, the, the young people, it's personalization and choice means that they get personalizing and choosing. So they don't, it's not everybody goes and does five hires over two years. It should be a mixture. And the, the subjects that the young person has the aptitude to do in over, should, they should be, be allowed to do that. And, and, it's, and then if, they, if they're not, they don't want to do that in the hire and they don't, you know, there should be flexibility. And again, um, lots, of, lots of issues get blown up because they're not communicated well. And, and it's just, this is, this is the way it's going to be. And if anybody um, challenges that, then a campaign is set up around it. That was a, a, a distressing situation for the young people and the parents in that particular school. And there's lots of kind of things that go on around that in different schools. But it, it boils down to the, the more that you know about what's happening in the school, the less um, contentious it's going to be at, and there's less flare-ups there will be. Okay. Yep, Ms. Pryor, again, just, again echoing Joanna's point, we know what we know. And we, as parents, are from a previous generation, and our experience of school is entirely different. Therefore, our experience, we take that when we look at our child's school and we think, well, we didn't do that. That's not how it worked for us. And so, you know, there's a lot of work to be done to, to help parents understand the opportunities and agree a route forward. So not impose, but agree a route forward for our school and our, our community. And, and, and also, if, if, you're, if your main source of edu um, in, information about what's happening in your child's school is through in the tabloid press, and you don't have anything from, you know, then that's the decision sometimes, that's where it all comes from. You know, if this, sometimes this, the, the education system um, neglects the sending the information out, leaving a vacuum. And so time and time again, you see where somebody ha doesn't have, is not in possession of all the actual facts and just has some weird idea about what might be happening in their school. And we can see all too often what, how, that, how that works out. Okay. I, I think that concludes our question this morning. Uh, can I thank you all for your attendance? Um, it's been very helpful and also for the submissions that have come to, to the committee through our deliberations. Uh, um, on that, we're going to move into private session.